Welcome to this edition of Labor Vision. I'm Bob Delaney, Executive Director of the Institute for Labor Studies and Research. Labor Vision, a production of the Institute, focuses on topics of importance to working Rhode Island families. We hope you enjoy this evening's edition. Good evening, my name is Jim Riley. Welcome to Labor Vision. I'm with the Rhode Island Institute for Labor Studies and Research. You know, Rhode Island, as many of us know, is a place of first. We had the first synagogue in the United States here in Rhode Island. We were the dawn of the uh, Industrial Revolution here in Rhode Island. We, we fired the first shot in the Revolutionary War. And now we've got something really, really interesting, a new first here in Rhode Island. We have the first offshore wind farm farm in the United States of America. And my guests here tonight are Chris Van Beek from Deepwater Wind and also Miles Grant from the National Wildlife Federation and George Nee, president of the AFL-CIO. Let's start with you, uh, Chris. Tell us, uh, tell us a, basically, our listeners may not know what an offshore wind farm is, what it takes to build a, a farm, where we are at this point right now. Give us a background in the, uh, on the Block Island uh, offshore wind farm. Yeah. Well, everybody knows uh, wind farms. They can see it uh, onshore with uh, the mast and uh, the blades. Uh, so an offshore wind farm is more or less the same, but then built in, uh, in the ocean. Uh, and in an ocean state, that's a, a nice combination, uh, I would say. Uh, onshore wind farms have the problem that people don't like them that much. You see them, uh, you have the, the flicker and the noise. But if you build them far away in the ocean, then you don't have the downside of uh, offshore wind, but uh, you have the positive of renewable energy. Also, the wind regime is better offshore, so the efficiency of uh, offshore wind is higher than, uh, than onshore wind. And that's one of the reasons why it starts in Rhode Island, because Rhode Island is famous for the wind regime. Sailing is, is really good here. Wind picks up in the afternoon. In winter, the wind is uh, good. So this is an ideal place to uh, start an offshore wind farm. We've got a lot of wind here in Rhode Island, that's for sure. Um, I know that you were trying to uh, get a, a wind farm at, at the Cape, the Cape, uh, Cape Cod uh, wind farm. And that was considerably a lot more wind turbines that we're talking about. We're only talking about five here in Rhode Island. And uh, that one didn't quite make it. What was different here in Rhode Island? What was the process that got us through to the point where we are today? Yeah, well, first, it was not Deepwater Wind trying to do that. That was a different company, uh, nothing to do with Deepwater Wind, Cape Wind. Mm -hmm. and they thought that uh, Cape Wind uh, in the Nantucket Sound was uh, a good place to build a wind farm. Uh, so it was rather their decision to go there. And compared to Rhode Island, where we did the OSAMP, where we had a kind of zoning uh, uh, effort for the ocean here in the Rhode Island and Massachusetts, where the authorities did a good uh, investigation on where offshore wind would fit and where other use of uh, the ocean uh, would not be counterproductive with wind and the other way around. So that's why uh, the OSAM, the CRMC, assigned the area where we built the, the Block Island wind farm for offshore uh, wind. So it's easier to permit if you already have a zoning effort uh, that dedicates that area to, uh, to offshore wind. Chris, today is December 7th, and I understand you have some interesting news regarding the harvesting of this wind at the Block Island Wind Farm. Yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic day or a fantastic week because we are exporting power uh, to, uh, to the shore. So our system is that uh, first we export it to Block Island, but then there is a new uh, power line between Block Island and the mainland. Uh, so we are exporting uh, power to the mainland uh, with our uh, wind farm. And so that's the first offshore power uh, in the United States. First time. So the studio might have uh, a percentage of its uh, energy is coming from renewable offshore wind. Fabulous, great news. Okay, Miles Grant from the National Wildlife Federation. We're happy to have you here with us tonight. 
Uh, tell us uh, why, the, why the National Wildlife Fund is so interested, Wildlife Federation, is so interested in this sort of activity. You guys have been involved in this from day one. What, what's the big interest with you and uh, what's happening here on the offshore wind farm? Absolutely. We believe that offshore wind power can be the most wildlife-friendly form of energy in the United States. And we believe that climate change is one of the biggest threats to wildlife in the United States. So we really feel like that this is uh, you know, a pioneering project that I think years from now we're going to look back on this as you know, the first uh, of a new wave of energy in the United States that's going to cut our carbon footprint, be wildlife friendly, and bring more jobs to our states. Did you have any problems with any other organizations uh, when, when you first came on uh, uh, supporting this program? Were there other organizations, somewhat like your own, that, that were concerned about uh, uh, some of the changes that may happen as a result of the building? No, I think environmental groups certainly are concerned that the projects are done right, both in construction and in operation. But I think disagreement among environmentalists can be overblown by, frankly, a lot of front groups for fossil fuel industries that are looking to fight clean energy. I think if you actually talk to environmental groups, look, we want to make sure that you know, right whale migration patterns are protected. We want to make sure birds are protected. We want to make sure fish are protected. But the offshore wind companies have gone above and beyond to make sure that these projects are being done right. And frankly, if you talk to the coal, oil, and gas industries, you might not get such a friendly response when it comes to protecting wildlife. So those of, for those of us who are watching today and are concerned about the environmental impact of this farm uh, uh, off the waters of Block Island, what would you say were the, uh, what, what's are the, invent, what is the environmental impact? Well, I think these projects have been extensively studied. These federal wind areas have been studied both for bird impact and for marine mammal impact. And I, I think what Deepwater and other companies have looked at is the right whale migration patterns that say these right whales come through at certain times of the year. Can we uh, you know, minimize or avoid construction during those times when especially the noise can be very disruptive to some of those marine mammals? But it's been done right. We think that these projects can be built and operate in a very wildlife-friendly way. And I think you also have to look at what is being offset here. You know, De Block Island was being powered by a diesel oil generator that burned a million gallons of diesel oil a year. I mean, imagine the pollution of not just for wildlife, but for the humans on that island that can impact public health. So these turbines are certainly cleaning our air, and they're powering our uh, mainland now with clean energy. So that certainly is an, uh, a really tough issue for those folks out there on Block Island that had all that, uh, was it kerosene? What was it? Diesel oil. Diesel, Diesel oil. And, in, uh, and how many millions of gallons every year? A million out? gallons a year. And so those Imagine had to be what a, what brought out to the island at a risk of spills and then burned at a certainty of impacting our public health. Mm -hmm. Great. George Nee, I don't know anybody in the States that's more concerned about economic development than you. Well, thank you. I am. <laughs> <laughs> I know you are. I know. And I know that labor had a lot to do with this project, uh, that we worked directly with the individuals involved in, in putting this whole thing together. And um, uh, tell us about, uh, what, about labor's input in this and uh, how we were able to uh, go forward as far as renewable energies and be supportive of that sort of activity and still create jobs at the same time and protect jobs. Absolutely. Well, the labor movement was involved uh, with this uh, project right from the very beginning, uh, particularly through our uh, Building Trades Council, which uh, will be uh, members of uh, the council will be talking uh, later about uh, the impact on their membership. But uh, if, we, if we look at this in some context, I think a great deal of credit ha it should be uh, given to Deepwater Wind. This was not an easy journey. Is that safe to say, uh, Chris? <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> this was a long and arduous journey, but it is a wonderful example of what happens when business, labor, and government work together uh, on a project that's beneficial to everybody. Uh, this uh, required a legislative approval on several occasions. Uh, it involved a long process through regulatory agencies. Uh, and the labor movement uh, stood with Deepwater Wind right from the very beginning uh, to turn the tide. This was not something that was uh, initially accepted. People were nervous about it. There were people who didn't want to see alternative energy or uh, offshore wind uh, develop because it might affect them economically. But I think the labor movement saw the vision of this, that this was an opportunity for our state to become a leader and to get out in front of a, uh, a, an economic development opportunity uh, which 
took advantage of the fact that we are the ocean state, as Chris mentioned. Um, this starts off with the turbines that are now uh, operating off of uh, Block Island, but this is going to expand, uh, and I forget the exact number, what is it, Chris, if, if, uh, for the next level, it's going to be how many uh, turbines? Well, it depends, yeah, uh, but probably 20, 30, and then after that, we can go to an extra 100. So, so the potential, uh, and what we're hoping is that this will be not just the operation of the wind turbines off of Block Island, but it will add to uh, a, perhaps a manufacturing facility here. One of the disadvantages right now is a lot of the work and a lot of the technology has been developed in Europe. What we're hoping is that as we move along here, that technology and that work will be done right here in Rhode Island, hopefully down at Providence Port, perhaps at Quonset, staging areas, manufacturing, repair facilities. So we're building, we're, we're building an industry. This is not, you know, five offshore turbines, and that's the end of the story. This is the beginning of a brand new economic development for Rhode Island and for our working people. So uh, we've gone from five wind, offshore wind turbines to the possibility of a big industry here in Rhode Island. We started it, we own it. That's correct. Yeah, terrific. So uh, and any closing thoughts from you? Because I know this is a very exciting time for you, having the power turned on today. It's an exciting time for everybody. Uh, like George said, I think cooperation with uh, the labor organizations was fantastic. The talent here in this state on, on labor is unbelievable. Uh, it's a new industry, so if you combine uh, the economic opportunity there with the talent here, the future for uh, the state uh, can be uh, enormous. And I think we have proven that on Block Island, where we already had 300 uh, local Rhode Island workers uh, working on this small uh, wind farm. And the foundations were built in Louisiana. For the next project, we will build the foundations over here. So it will be a multiple factor of, uh, of, of those people. The talent is here, the cooperation is here. Uh, so I see a bright future. Chris, the most productive workers in the world are from the United States of America. And the most productive workers in the United States of America are from Rhode Island. Thank you for your be, time. Couldn't be better said. <laughs> Thank you, and we'll see you again on Labor Vision. This is an exciting time to be in Rhode Island. This is this is workforce development here. We've we've really got a, 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 our economy is going to be boosted by a lot of jobs here. We're, these are the first five turbines in the United States of America. We've got them. They're off our shores. This isn't just a project, as you said. This is the beginning of an industry. This you have it exactly right. And from day one, we've imagined and dreamed that if we're the first ones in, we get a foothold on this industry. We have two ports that are highly usable. Now we have the experience, and we think, you know, whether these things are done in Delaware, whether they're done in New Jersey, whether they're done in Massachusetts, we think Rhode Island should and could play a part. It would be our intentions to try to stay involved as much as possible. And I'll also say, you know, outside of the unionized jobs, which are really important, and, you know, potentially there could be manufacturing jobs here fabricating and manufacturing some of this, which we hope would be union on jobs. There's also an, a lot of ancillary jobs, mom pa jobs, uh, jobs in the in the whole, in the trail of this industry. And if we can bring some of those to Rhode Island, important for Rhode Island's economy also. Exciting. And all the best also uh, to Michael Sabatoni, uh, the president of the building trades, who certainly played a big role in this activity. It's essential to say that, you know, Michael steers the ship. There's no doubt about it. And we tease him oftentimes. but. He, from day one, put his foot down about this. He drove this fight, he led this fight, he never stopped. He probably was at every single meeting 
and then there has been a combination of people there at many of these things. Every single meeting that had anything to do with this from the beginning to the end, he deserves the utmost credit and really this was his vision as much as anybody's vision. Ladies and gentlemen, the Scott Duhamel. Thank you, Scott. We are here with Matt Morrissey, Vice President of Deepwater Wind. This must be a really exciting day for you, and even more exciting day coming up in a couple of weeks when we pull the switch and we start bringing that power in. This is an exciting day for uh, anyone who cares about clean energy, jobs, and, uh, and uh, organized labor participating in a, at the level that organized labor participating in. You know, without the trades, this project couldn't have happened. So it's a great day for offshore winds, a great day for the state of Rhode Island. I was on the Mass, uh, uh, Vice President on the Mass AFL-CIO, and I remember when we were trying to get the project with the Cape, Cape uh, Wind Farm, they we were talking about 130 turbines, I believe, at the time. Maybe that scared some people off, but we've got five in the ground now. Uh, uh, do you see this growing? I, I'm sure that Governor Baker has taken a look at this. So. Uh, we at Deep Harbor believe that uh, starting small and then growing quickly is the right approach. So Block Island does represent just the first. Uh, we demonstrated that this project can get built, uh, it can get financed, it can be insured. Uh, there is going to be uh, projects coming forward in uh, Long Island. There will be projects in Massachusetts for certain. Uh, the law that was passed and signed by Governor Baker in August calls for 1,600 megawatts to be developed over the next eight years. So this is the beginning, the launch of the United States offshore wind industry, and we are proud to be the company uh, that got us here. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about the advanced technology involved in these turbines? So over the last 10 years, the technology, first of all, has gotten much bigger. Okay, the turbines that we saw today, the 6 megawatt GE turbine, we started, when this project started in 2008, we were looking at 3 megawatt turbines. So each turbine can produce double the power capacity uh, that the turbines just 10 years ago could produce. And the next projects, these turbines will be 8 and 10 megawatts. So the power production capacity of each of these turbines is growing exponentially. And what that means is that the cost per unit goes down dramatically because you just don't have to put as many up. You mentioned that Cape Wind in Massachusetts was a project that was promoting 132 turbines. Well, for the same amount of power generation today, that number is between 40 and 50 turbines. Right. That's amazing. Matt, I've got an, uh, I'm thinking that you're going to be very, very busy uh, with your projects all around New England and, and elsewhere, and we wish you the best of luck. And thanks for helping us out with economic development here in Rhode Island. We, could, we couldn't do it without the state of Rhode Island and without organized labor. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. All the best. Most Americans know very little about the struggles our ancestors went through for workers to win the right to organize unions and bargain collectively. These rights were paid for by the blood and sacrifices of countless men and women who came before us. The gains unions won in the past 200 years are absolutely staggering, and not just for union workers, but for all of society. To understand the history of the struggle, we start centuries ago in Europe. Unions are often seen as successors to the ancient guilds of the Middle Ages. Guilds were groups of craftsmen who formed into organizations that protected their craft. They paid dues, regulated the rates their members could charge, and maintained standards of quality. While guilds resembled today's unions, the members were not employees working for an employer. These were craftsmen in business for themselves. Guilds faded in influence, and for centuries, most employers were simply small business owners hiring local craftsmen to work in their shops. With the development of machinery powered by water and later by steam, the Industrial Revolution changed the nature of work. 
Beginning in the middle of the 18th century, production shifted from small-scale crafts to an economy based on large numbers of unskilled laborers making vast amounts of goods in factories. The textile industry in England was the first to change. Any craft having to do with thread or fabric was rapidly replaced with massive textile mills. The skills weavers had developed over decades were now useless, and entire families of weavers had no choice but to move to the cities and work in the factories. While the Industrial Revolution destroyed the livelihood of many crafts, new opportunities did arise. There was now much more buying, selling, and transporting of goods. The entire revolution is based on making huge quantities of goods in one place and then shipping them elsewhere. The supply of cheap goods encouraged the construction of roads, ships, canals, and eventually railroads. With the improved systems of transport, mass-produced goods were available to more and more people. The middle class grew rapidly, and the standard of living of much of the country rose. The ongoing enclosure and consolidation of land holdings, combined with advancements and mechanization in agriculture, reduced the need for farm labor and drove rural families to seek work in the new industrial centers. Unfortunately, the value of workers dropped as the supply grew. Factory owners cut wages until their workers' very survival was at stake. Men toiling up to 16 hours a day couldn't feed their families so their wives also went to work in the mills. When families were still unable to make ends meet, the children were sent into the factories and mines. Working 70 to 100 hours a week for mere pennies of pay, there was little time for sleep or play. Children received only scraps of education if they attended school at all. Boys and girls were literally used as beasts of burden crawling through narrow mine shafts, hauling heavy loads to the surface. When the English government finally investigated, the testimony in Parliament horrified people. Safety in the mines was almost non-existent. Textile mills were massive rooms filled with moving gears, pulleys, and other machinery without a single safety guard in place. Children actually worked inside machines while they were running to remove debris and to oil parts. Death was common, injuries constant. The use of machinery quickly spread to other industries. Shoemakers, rope makers, and iron workers soon followed the weavers into the factories. Their jobs were hard but simple. Oil these pulleys, replace these bobbins, haul these loads, the crowds of unemployed waiting for work outside the factory gates left those inside without any power to bargain for better wages or conditions. They were a commodity no different than the cotton ground up in the mills. In 1789, an apprentice in an English cotton mill, Samuel Slater, migrated to the United States and brought with him extensive knowledge of the machines and organization of the mills. Partnering with investors in Rhode Island, Slater founded the first cotton mills in the United States. They established villages and recruited entire families to work in the mills. And, as in England, children were employed. Over the next 50 years, Slater and other entrepreneurs built a thriving textile industry in New England. One mill that opened in 1823 in Massachusetts became known as the Lowell Miracle. The mill and the surrounding town were designed to be a model of how to treat workers in a fair and just manner. Since the majority of those working in these mills would be young women, the company built dormitories and hired chaperones to protect the women's honor. In the early years, the Lowell Mills were relatively clean, orderly, and decent places to work, and people came from around the world to see them. Eventually, other mills sprang up, and the competition drove down profits. The owners began pressuring the workers to go faster and to do more, and the women of Lowell found their work increasingly difficult. In 1834, when the owners cut their wages, 
the Lowell workers finally had had enough and walked out. Without any planning or prior organization, the strike was not successful. Its leaders were fired, and most of the women went back to work. But the Lowell women now knew what to expect, and they planned for the next battle. When the company imposed a significant increase in their boarding costs in 1836, they walked out again. This time they were highly organized and united, leaving the factories in shifts and living at home to save money. This put so much pressure on the owners that they soon gave in, and the increase in room and board was dropped. There's a belief in American labor that the rights of workers enjoy today were won mostly by men, but this early victory by the women at Lowell illustrates another side to the story. It is true, however, that most initial efforts at organizing workers in the United States took place among the skilled trades dominated by men. As early as 1794, shoemakers in Philadelphia established a society of journeymen and conducted a strike. By the 1830s, working people in many eastern cities were organized into trade societies. These craft unions used collective bargaining to fight for higher wages, shorter hours, and better working conditions. Many of these early unions also called for women's right to vote, an end to slavery, a 10-hour workday, abolition of imprisonment for debt, and free public education for children. Business owners responded to the early unions by turning to the courts, where they generally found support. Conservative judges often ruled that labor organizations were illegal conspiracies. For instance, in Philadelphia in 1806, eight bootmakers were indicted for being part of a combination and conspiracy because they organized to demand higher wages. For this, the courts determined they had violated the law of the land and were fined $8 plus court costs. As industrialization came to the United States, many of the conditions and practices that plagued England also came. Low wages, unsafe working conditions, 14-hour days, and child labor were all part of the dismal picture faced by an increasing number of working families in the 1800s. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Labor Vision. We appreciate your input and encourage your comments. Labor Vision can be seen on this channel three times each week, Tuesday at 7 p.m., Thursday at 8 p.m., and Saturday at 5 p.m.